October the 20th, 2024. In the portion of Mark's gospel that we heard today, James and John had given up their family fishing business, dropped everything to follow Jesus. And so they came to him asking for special privileges, for one to be placed on his left and one to be placed on his right when the, he came into his glory. Now it appears on the surface that James and John are simply just making a power play. They're looking out for themselves. And it appears like yet another story in which the disciples are clueless, unable to comprehend the teachings of what Jesus came to say. Now, in this passage, Jesus predicts a third time his death and his suffering. And yet here are James and John, not hearing that, they're applying for leadership positions in his new regime. On the surface, this looks like blind ambition. Now, if we look back a little bit, <coughs> just a few verses before this story in Mark's gospel, Mark says, the disciples were afraid. Well, you know, that sheds some new light on this. What if James and John merely wanted to have a secure future? What if they just wanted some assurance amidst Jesus' predictions of his suffering and death that everything would just be all right? What if they were simply afraid? Well, most of us can easily identify with the disciples' fear. Fear is a powerful, powerful emotion. Fear can cause us to forget our passion and our compassion, and can make us rather judgmental. Fear can often paralyze us and tempt us to just quit. As we sit here in a culture of increasingly less interest in organized religion, it can be easy to fear for the future of the church, for the future of our neighborhoods, for the future of our communities. So can we really blame James and John for wanting a little assurance that things are going to work out? So we look at Jesus' response to them. He said, can you drink the cup I drink. Can you be baptized with the same baptism? In essence, they will be with Jesus, and Jesus will be with them. Jesus will be with them no matter what. But even today, there are still some who believe if you just follow the rules, if you're just good enough, you will never experience pain. Well, that thinking is not only wrong, but it's harmful. It's dangerous. Because Jesus, who was God's own son, wound up dying in a cross. How are we to think that we would come out of this any better?
The book of Hebrews tells us Jesus prayed while he lived on earth. He made his sincere cries. He made his appeal with tears. He prays that God would save him from death. God answered Jesus because he was truly honoring God. Jesus was God's son, but by suffering, he learned what it meant to truly obey. Again, Jesus is our example to follow. We are to follow Christ into submission. Now, that's great. But James and John were not looking to submit to the same fate as Jesus. I think they were looking for security. They were looking for a place of prominence. They were looking for some recognition, not submission. Now, think about that word submission. It's not real popular in our culture. We prefer phrases like, no retreat, no surrender. Never back down. Stand on your own two feet. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Our understanding of toughness is not faith in God, not trusting in God's presence or his direction. It's more like the quarterback who leads his team down the field for that final go-ahead touchdown while he has a broken nose. We don't like wailing and tears. We like people who suck it up. But as Christians, as followers of the one who submitted, not just to being human, but who submitted to a cross, we are to be present with each other just as God is present with us. To practice that ministry of presence requires that we surrender, that we submit our self-confidence, our self-reliance, our independence, and we submit to the confidence in God to our reliance upon God, and to our interdependence with each other. Now, that's great. Now, let's be honest. Following the path of Christ will have both joy and pain. Jesus, God's own son, we say, God made flesh. He died on a cross because God refused to separate him from humanity. He refused to separate him from us. So God became one of us. He lived among us, and he even suffer, suffered and died because of us. The testimony of the cross is even in our darkest hour, even it, when it seems like all hope is lost, even when fear threatens to cripple us, God has been there and God is with us. We can't limit God. And mean, indeed, God is with us even in our darkest most depressing hours. The main way we experience God among us is through the body of Christ, the people gathered for worship, the people who come to the table and receive the body of Christ 
so that they can then be the body of Christ in the world. So I invite you, come to his house, receive his word, receive his patience and hope and grace, then go out in the world and do his work as strengthened and renewed people, empowered by his presence to do the work, as the hymn says, that keeps faith sweet and strong. Go out into the world as the body of Christ to seek and serve all people in the name of Jesus. Go into the world and heal the sick, feed the hungry, comfort those who mourn, free the captives, and let the world know that the love of God cannot be defeated. Yes, I believe that James and John were struggling to truly hear, accept, and understand what Jesus was telling them. Perhaps they wanted a guaranteed spot in the kingdom. Perhaps they were afraid of following Jesus because the same fate was waiting for them. But they were seeking some assurance of security and greatness in God's kingdom. But then Jesus laid it out very clearly. Whoever wants to be great among you must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That's what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served. And then he gave away his life for many. Now, that's great. Amen.